we had uh, done a number of concept albums that we built big shows around, and we had toured those and had built up a pretty good audience. And I think we got to a point after uh, doing these records with Bearsville, um, we decided that we would try a slightly different tack because we had a new label, a new approach, and they were ready to really get behind us. And um, so we decided to, you know, to try and make a pop record instead of making a <clears throat> concept record or a record with heavy political overtones or anything like that. We would just sort of. Um, try as best we could to uh, you know conjure up some sort of pop mentality and just do all pop songs and it turned out to be not as difficult I guess as we thought because we went up in an album and a half's worth of, of material it would only have been a CD's worth nowadays but in those days it was 15 or 16 songs and um, so they got the idea to put out an album and a half an album that's a normal album with two different sides, and then the other album was like the third side twice. <laughs> I think it was, you know, third side on both sides of the disc. We would uh, come in with various fragmentary ideas. Very rarely would someone have a whole song done, and that we would simply just learn the song and play it. Um, if that were to have the most likely, I would have some songs done. And I remember that I did do some demos for. Uh, swing to the right and POV, but I'm pretty sure that um, the uh, the record was written mostly in the studio. Chasm essentially rejoined the band right before we did the record, and uh, from uh, you know from an outward standpoint, nobody knew the difference because we didn't do an in album in between with that Chasm not on it. Um, and uh, the sessions, as I recall, were fairly easy going. We took a, uh, a certain approach to the sound. Uh, I used the same, rather than trying to get different guitar sounds or a great variety of sounds, or even the sound that I usually had on my records, which was <clears throat> sort of a bigger, heavily distorted and very soaring solo sound and all this other stuff. Um, I bought myself, I think I bought the Super Beetle amp and decided that only the sounds that could come out of that amp would be the sound of the guitar. So uh, we put certain limitations on what we would do on the, uh, on the amount of overdubbing. We, we usually did uh, make some attempt to sound like a four piece, even though it might be a very large sounding four piece. We always eschewed too much overdubbing just for the sake of overdubbing. So uh, when it got to performing uh, Utopia, the album, um, we t took a pretty much a, a pretty stripped down approach to the way it was performed, to the sounds that we would draw on. Uh, we didn't want to get any sort of exotic synthesizer sounds, so Roger had to get sort of like a more conventional range of sounds from the keyboard and uh, basically made the album very clean and dry in the pr from a production standpoint. And uh, it seemed to work well. The record company liked it and they did like all the material, so they put out the album and a half. I recall it was probably our best reviewed album. Um, Stereo Review gave it its featured five-star review that month or whatever, the full page thing with the picture and everything. They said, this is the perfect pop album, blah, blah, blah. So we, you know, we, I think we fairly well hit the mark that we were going for. Unfortunately, immediately after the album came out, just as these things always seem to happen throughout the career of Utopia, um, Electra, who was the distributor of Network Records, uh, decided to close their New York office, which was where uh, Network had been situated. They decided that they wanted to do everything different. Al Corey we used to be with RSO Records in LA. He decided to move, to move his new label, Network, to New York. And we were like the, you know, the first band he signed for the label. He had a couple other things. Almost immediately as the, as the album is released, uh, Electra decides to close down their New York office and everyone has to close up shop and move back to LA. 
And that, this is all when they're supposed to be, you know, promoting a record and stuff like that. So essentially the record went right through the cracks, like, <clears throat> like so many of our <laughs> other records. And, uh, and never did had you know anything like the string of hits that it possibly could have had because um, the uh, label went into a state of as I as I recall I think that Al Corey decided well screw it I'm not even moving back to L.A. I'm just going to get out of the business and he just shut the label down and so we were back on the street again looking for independent distribution <laughs> after that. Since we had pretty much recorded it with the, with a certain degree of discipline, a four piece, trying to sound as much like a four piece as possible, not extend ourselves beyond what we were capable of performing, then when it came to doing it live, it was really easy. We had already done it more or less once in the studio. It wasn't a question of rearranging or <clears throat> or, or reshuffling things around in order to be able to play them. It was just rehearse a little more and and go out and do it. And I recall like one of the very first gigs we did um, was the Roxy in New York. Was it still called the Roxy? The Ritz. The Ritz, yes, down on 11th Street or something like that. And we decided we wanted to do a whole the whole four-piece mop top thing. So we rented a limousine. We all got into the limousine with our guitars. Uh, and pulled up in front of the gig. We didn't go in the back end, just pulled up in front of the gig and like did, had a whole swarm cam thing with flashbulbs and everything and came in through the crowd with our instruments and everything, went directly from the limo to the stage and played the show. And, and uh, I don't think we went back to the limo, we went back to the dressing room. But yeah, it was a chance for us to sort of live out a, you know, like a, a, a proto-pop fantasy as if we, had actually been together in the late 60s or something. So, uh, yeah, it just it turned out to be uh, uh, a lot of fun to, to be, uh, just be a four-piece and be expected to sound like a four-piece and not to have to do any more production than was necessary for a four-piece. You know, in fact, our live shows from, from those days didn't involve anything at all in terms of production. It was just we would dress up in nice suits, and that was it. Roger would have been the first one to uh, join the band. He came in to replace uh, M. Frog, who was our who was our synthesist. He was more of a treatment guy. You know, he do like sound effects and treat the sound of my guitar and stuff like that. He didn't know how to play keyboards at all, <clears throat> and we already had two keyboard players already, so it wasn't a terrifically important thing. But we did want somebody who knew something about the. Um, about the synthesizer and what could be done with it. And Roger at the time, I believe he was a consultant at, uh, at, at Moog and Art. He was consulting all these synthesizer companies. And, and so he was a, uh, uh, in, in a very small pool of, of synthesists at the time. You know, he was one of the uh, more reputable ones. And I believe he came down to see the band actually in a very seminal some sort of gig. The first band, you know, was a big kind of free-for-all of a band. We had some really complicated and tight material, but we used to give people, you know, every we had at least four soloists, and each one of them got like five minutes every song. <laughs> so the, the shows were like four and a half hours long and things like that. They would just go on forever. Um, when Roger joined, uh, it became apparent that he was not just a a guy who made noises and things like that and treatments and, and that sort of shit. He could, uh, he could actually play the keyboard. He was a classically trained pianist. So, uh, so then we had three keyboard players. And we, we had that for a while and that was, an, that was you know, still more soloing and stuff going on. And guys in the band started to, uh, started to want to move on to other things. Uh, and I believe the first one to leave was uh, was Ralph Shuckett. Uh, he had uh, he started developing a relationship with a woman named Ellen Shipley, and they started writing songs and stuff together. and And so he he was tired of the road, and he wanted to uh, 
to do something else, get it involved in something else. Eventually, Moogie decided he wanted to produce records or something, so he left, and Roger was then the only keyboard player left. Not too long before we did the second live album, Kevin Elman decided that he wanted to uh, do something else. As a matter of fact, he got out of the music business altogether and decided to go work <clears throat> for his dad, Beefsteak Charlie. And uh, so he got in the restaurant business. <laughs> and now he's like a CNBC TV ad analyst or something. Um, so Willie, I met Willie because he was playing with Hall & Oates when I produced their third album, I guess it was. It was called War Babies. And Willie was the drummer on that. And Willie, uh, I think when the spot became open, wanted to get into something more adventurous musically than what he thought was going to happen with Hall & Oates. So he uh, joined the band while we were still a seven-piece band. <laughs> and, and eventually when the two keyboard players left, uh, we went down to... Uh, were we seven or six? We seven. We had three keyboard players, including a synthesizer player, bass, and drums. Yeah, that was okay. We were six pieces. <laughs> it got so confusing because when we did another live, we had singers as well come along. So we had, you know, this um, fairly uh, humongous unit. Uh, <clears throat> so Willie uh, was there from fairly early on. Roger was there pr pretty much from right after the first album on. M Frog made a tour with us, and then that was about it. Realized that he wasn't uh, pulling his weight, in a sense, for the amount of equipment we had to set up. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and then eventually we were, you know, we were a four piece for a little while with uh, with John Siegler, still on bass, and then John decided that he didn't want to go on the road anymore. He was getting married, and so he left the band as well. And we had to find another bass player and held auditions. And we auditioned a lot of people, including like Lance Hoppin, who's in Orleans and stuff. We had auditioned a couple of bass players that are up in the Woodstock area. And I don't know how Chasm got the word, but he came up. And, you know, at first he just seemed really young. You know, he just seemed, we thought, this guy's just a kid. You know, how's he going to, how's he going to fit in? And he was also, uh, not entirely familiar with the kind of music that we were doing up until then. He was very much a pop guy. He had, uh, Paul McCartney was his idol, and and he always expected to, uh, you know, perform in pop music as opposed to the sort of fusion music. But he was a good, solid bass player, and he had a he had a good, clear, high voice, which was something that was useful. Uh, the other guys in the band, while they could all carry a melody, not, none of them were really singers to the point where they could front their own band or or uh or have a solo album even though Mookie had solo albums you know uh he sold those on the basis of the c kind of uh, c uh character that he would adopt in his voice i guess um but uh that pretty much was the what turned out to be the the final permutation of of utopia by the time those four survivors, me and Roger and William Chasm, uh, by the time he made it through the auditions, the lineup pretty much didn't change until the band eventually went on permanent hiatus. Roger, you would have to say, had a uh, sophisticated harmonic sensibility that, you know, even I, that didn't resemble mine at all. I, didn't mind getting into you know bizarre eleme uh, elements of harmony and melody and things like that, but Roger uh, had had a solo album out. It was an instrumental album of, with mostly all synthesizer music, but he knew how to build a you know a piece of music. <clears throat> and he occasionally come in with whole songs that were fine. So in the context of our you know, of our being in the studio and kind of like, okay, I got like a verse and I got a chorus. Roger could be depended on to come up with something, you know, a little bit more unusual, ideally. And um, and he would, you know, and he would bring in these, you know, sometimes very unusual uh, 
asymmetric or arrhythmical uh, patterns that he had worked out. Willie, oddly enough, uh, actually makes his musician his life as a musician nowadays as a composer. So Willie would have uh, uh, song ideas all the time, and sometimes whole complete songs. Uh, Willie's hard, most difficult thing was uh, lyrics. Uh, he could come up with uh, uh, something that was relative, relatively poetic, but often he wouldn't have lyrics finished for the songs. He would have, you know, basic ideas and some melody ideas, but very rarely any any lyrical ideas. So I would usually have to come up with lyrics. Chasm would have songs of his own, and the most successful single that Utopia ever had was a song that Chasm just completely wrote it himself and probably would have put on a solo album, which was called Love Alone, and it was somewhat out of character for the band, uh, the song. I usually would be responsible for making sure everything got tied together. Or make, what I usually do in the studio is, you know, I, I come up with whatever else is lacking. And of course, I'd have some song ideas of my own that we would put forward. But hardest thing always is to come up with the lyrics. And it would usually be my responsibility, you know, after the band was done, to come in early in the mornings or late in the day and sit down with the tapes and finally figure out what the song is about and write the lyrics and everything. So. Well, in the old days, when you usually were promoting an album, you know, song selection is always he heavily loaded with whatever the latest release is. So, and often the entire concept may hinge around whatever the latest release is. Uh, but we would often uh, come up with some sort of performance concept, some you know set or or way of presenting the material before we ever think about, you know, or the order of the material or, or things like that. Um, a lot of the shows as time went on would become, they would overlap in some ways. There was a period between like raw and swing to the right where we would come out as our own opening band and we would just come out in like black jeans and white t-shirts and there would be a curtain in front of the set and we'd just come out and play like 40, a 40 minute set of like stuff from Swing to the Right. And then we come back out and do like Adventures in Utopia and Ra and all that other stuff and it, with all the sp spectacle and everything that went along with it. So there was, you know, in some cases like a conflict where we'd go, we'd be going f from a recording standpoint for something really stripped down and, and, and gritty or something like that. In the meantime, everyone's coming to the shows expecting us to jump off of pyramids, you know, and flamethrowers and the whole damn deal. So we did have a, a, a transition period in there. Um, as our relationship with uh, Bearsville ended and we had to get into more independent uh, sort of deals, yeah, we didn't get the, um, the tour support anymore. So we couldn't go out and start building big things and renting trucks to haul them around and we started, we started to have to work more or less within our immediate means. And it's, as time went on, it's the same thing that happens with everyone. Your audience just tends to, you know, tends to shrink. You get replaced by more trendy bands like Flock of Seagulls or something, you know. And so we, uh, we uh, continued to, you know, to lay on the production to whatever degree we were financially capable. But in the later touring years, we were just, we were pretty stripped down. We, went out the last official tour we did in which we opened for the uh, the tubes um, we had brought it down pretty much to what what technologically was the bare minimum possible at that point we had little lapel mics we didn't have mic stands on the stage we had lapel mics and ear monitors we were the first band to use ear monitors exclusively of course Willie had his little motorcycle drum kit as well and uh, and we could set up in front of a big production band like the Tubes, you know, who would have like the whole stage covered with crap and not have any sort of like conflict because we didn't have any monitors to set up, no mic stands to set up, nothing. And uh, 
Yeah, it contrasted heavily with, you know, the days of Ra and stuff like that when we had to set up, a, you know, a whole pyramid every night. And, and you know, we're freezing guitars made out of ice, you know, we're out wind machines and tumbleweeds and all that stuff. It, uh, yeah, it got pretty, uh, pretty hectic. Those shows were, they're like Broadway shows. They require this very sort of precision timing, you know, that starts long before the show actually starts. When I was in high school, I, uh, I became fascinated with computers. I became fascinated with the computers before I was in high school. I got fascinated with them when, as soon as I knew there was such a thing. So there it was, computers and robotics. And I was, at first I was into robotics. I wanted a robot pal. Then realized, you know, robots need artificial brains. So you have to know something about building, something about what they called cybernetics at the time, which was uh, the, uh, the applications of Boolean algebra, which is, you know, the basics of Boolean algebra, algebra which is like, what can you do with this and this? you know, in and, and various combinations. So there are all sorts of logical operations that are the building blocks of every computer processor made, which are AND gates, OR gates, NAND, not AND gates, and NOR gates, and things like that. So when I graduated from high school, I had the option either of going to a technical school and learning how to program computers, or getting in a band, and I was fortunate enough to get into a band right away, uh, get noticed for my uh, skill as a guitar player, which confirmed that that music was a possibility. And then from there, I started, you know, I put together a band in Naz, uh, got discovered, got whisked off to, uh, uh, to New York and got a big record contract and never really had to go to tech school. But the advantage of being a musician is you don't have a regular job like other people do. You often have excess income that other people don't have. So, for instance, when I saw the first synthesizer, commercially available synthesizer that wasn't custom built like Moog's and stuff like that, it was called the, uh, the Putney. It was made by EMS, Electronic Music Systems, an English company. And I was in Manny's Music one day and there was a Putney the Putney synthesizer, and I said, I, that's mine. Bought it right out of the case that day, and got the keyboard for it and stuff, and started learning how to work a synthesizer. Um, years later, when I got into computers, you know, it's, I remember Roger said, hey, right down the street, uh, there's a place called somebody's California Computers or something like that, and they got the new Apple II Plus, which you can actually program. It's got a real programming language in it. And I said, oh, okay, cool. So we both went down and bought our Apple II Pluses and taught ourselves how to program computers. And, uh, and that's the same the way it was with video and everything, everything like that. It's just you buy the stuff you need to get hands on and then you teach yourself how to do it. And because you're a musician, you often have, I remember when I first got the computer, I, I almost took a whole year off just to learn how to program the computer. Didn't do hardly anything else. In a sense, it's uh, it's a uh, it's a two-way street. For instance, when I uh, got a little bit more proficient in the computer and I started getting programs put out by Apple and things like that, I, I got invited to hackers conferences. Started meeting all of the movers and shakers and all of the history makers in the computer business, and I didn't know who they were before. You know, so ostensibly they would have been heroes if I had known <laughs> who they were. But I didn't. I did meet some people that you know be, that I really admired and 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 whom I became friends with. But as I say, it became a two-way street. One of the uh, pioneers of, of all computer graphics is named is Jim Blinn, and he worked at the Jet Propulsion Lab down in Pasadena. And his job was to take all of those numbers that came back from satellites flying around Jupiter and flying through the solar system and stuff like that, and turn those numbers into pictures somehow because they didn't have, you know, a Hubble telescope that just takes a picture and sends a picture back. These things would do these elaborate scans, uh, with sometimes with infrared scanners and other kinds of things, elaborate slow scan of the surface of the planet. You could just come up with a giant list of numbers and they send it back 
and he would be responsible for turning these into pictures of satellites flying around planets so the public at large could find out what NASA was doing. <clears throat> and I met him at the conferences, you know, and everyone, everyone in the you know, computer graphics industry really looks up to him. And I got to meet him, found out also that, you know, he, like so many other people in music, he's also a musician. I mean, in computers, he's also a musician. And so I got to, you know, visit Jet Propulsion Lab and, and, and learn things from him and, and get some insights from him. He, in turn, got to play on one of my records. <laughs> he could play, got to play trombone. And he only ever played trombone before in the, you know, like, USC marching band or something. So, uh, so often what happened is I would allow those people into, the, you know, it, behind the scenes in the music business as they would be letting me behind the scenes in the technology business. And had a lot of, uh, eventually had a lot of relationships who were based on that overlap like being musical advisor uh, or uh, sound uh, consultant for General Magic or something like that. A company makes PDAs. They're not around anymore, but that was essentially the gig. So now it's gotten to the point where I do, you know, I'll speak to a whole bunch of uh, IBM employees about, you know, the possibilities of, um, uh, of what artists can do online and stuff like that. I'm still sort of bridging the gap. You know, the Bearsville years were, were interesting for us. Um, there was a lot, there had been a lot of tension uh, with the record company, and um, I think there was also a feeling that, um, you know, maybe we could get a little more support for some of the tours that we were doing. Um, I think all of the albums were fairly creative, but, you know, we definitely went through some transition points where um, it seemed like we needed to reevaluate what we were doing. And the network thing kind of represented um, our chance to, you know, break away from the, the, uh, the company we'd been with. And, you know, in actuality, our whole contract had come from Todd's contract with, with Bearsville. So um, he essentially started alternating albums. He'd do a solo album and then we'd do a, you know, do a Utopia album. So I think the, the thing with... Um, network was that, you know, here was a chance for Utopia to have its own record deal on its own. Um, and as far as touring goes, I'm, I mean, the band still had the, it was still the same lineup. We hadn't, we weren't changing anything there. When I joined the band, it was uh, still basically Moogie and the Rhythm Kings. Um, that was an amazing band. Uh, when I first saw them play, when they invited me to come down and uh, they were thinking about having me join the band, I wasn't actually aware of what was going on, but I got invited to this concert and I saw them play Todd's birthday at Central Park in 1974, I think 1974, and I was just blown away because it was this heavy kind of fusion music and I had just released a solo uh, album called Cosmic Furnace and my idols were Mahavishnu and uh, Miles Davis and so forth. So I was just blown away that these guys were, were able to get away with, you know, essentially taking pop music and running all over town with it with like this fusion and funk stuff. So that was that band. That was with Kevin Elman. Actually, none of the other guys that, I, that we eventually ended up with were, were in the band at that time. Um, and then one by one, they started... You know, those members started doing other things. Muggy went off to produce Bette Midler, and uh, Ralph Shuckett uh, decided he wanted to do, I think, like commercial music. Kevin Elman joined his father's uh, chain of steak and brew restaurants. Um, so the band started to disintegrate a little bit. Willie was the first one uh, to come in, and, and I think Todd had worked with him on the War Babies uh, album for Hall and & Oates. And he was currently playing with... Uh, I think he was actually backing up Bette Midler and Oysters on the Half Shell at that point. So he came from kind of an interesting background, very, you know, very studied, very uh, literate, very jazz-oriented drummer as well. He had, I think he played with Sarah Vaughan. 
So he came in and brought, you know, all of that. I had the synthesizer and sort of jazz and, and rock tendencies. Um, and then we, I think we, we got down to four people, but it was John Siegler still playing bass. John decided to get married, so now we need a bass player. Well, I called around, and a friend of mine, Michael Kamen, who um, was at that point in the New York Rock Ensemble, and I had actually played a concert with him in Venezuela. <laughs> it's my first solo, um, you know, whatever pop rock concert in Venezuela. It was put together to um, it was put together by the 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 political party in power at the time, and it was supposed to be this just this big rock and roll show so they can ingratiate all the voters. But the New York Rock Ensemble was the lead group, and I was playing synthesizer to, uh, as, a, as an opening thing. So now we have um, Chasm coming in with, uh, he's the kid, he's like the young guy, incredible voice, uh, great player, can play piano, can play everything, had his own home studio in his little basement in Staten Island. So now we had this tight, you know, lean, mean, utopia machine. And as you can see, I mean, and of course everyone knows Todd's, you know, background. Todd has interest in all kinds of music. Um, you can see that we were bringing in influences from all over the place. So I, I always thought that that was both the, um, the strong point and, in a way, the downfall of the band. The band's musical interests and its, its ability to actually perform all these different styles was capable. And so we tended to, you know, just kind of go all over the map musically. You know, unlike, you know, other bands which were, you know, sticking to their whatever, their heavy metal theme or whatever it was they were doing, you know, sort of one-minded, um, mm, the record company never knew what they were going to get from us. Um, and we just had a hell of a time, I mean, a good time, you know, making these records because we could essentially do anything we wanted. The whole idea was to try to do something you know, different and um, inspirational and creative. Uh, and of course, a lot of that spirit came, you know, came from Todd as well. Um, but I think the breadth of musical styles that the band, you know, could, could perform, um, you know, made it really interesting for all of us. And, and, and I think that that made it unique for the audience as well. we began to realize, hey, wait a minute, when we go on tour, we can actually uh, pull material from these various albums that are in a certain style, because every album would sort of have like maybe three or four different styles on it. Um, you know, we'd have our ballad style, uh, which we're really good at, obviously. Willie loved writing that type of stuff, and it fit right up, you know, what Todd did as well. Then we had, of course, the furious, you know, sort of jazz fusion stuff, which I loved, and Willie actually loved that stuff too. Um, and then Chasm was more like the hard rock type of a thing. So when I look back at the records, I realized like the, the last few tours that we did, we could decide what kind of a band we were going to be. Um, we, the Japanese tour that we did in 1992, um, we said, hey, let's just pick out all the kind of like, you know, play it hard edged, you know, kind of stuff. And and so we did, you know, we, we were able to put a whole show together um, with that stuff, and that was a lot of fun. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the diversity, like I say, I think the diversity was both a, a strength and maybe a drawback commercially, um, but fans loved it. I mean, they, they could see the thread of the core of, of, you know, the ideas, like, going throughout that. And I think, I think Todd, you know, gets a lot of credit for producing the records in a way where even though the styles might be, you know, divergent, um, the sound would always sound like Utopia. You could always tell it was a Utopia record. The band started off with a lot of ideals and wanting to make a big splash and do like a big, you know, presentation. There was always a desire to do some type of a presentation. Um, but you know, the way, it, <laughs> the way it worked out was, over the years with the record company, we steadily got less and less money f 
for each record that we would start. Um, probably because the last record hadn't sold enough, and so we were mortgaged. We were mortgaged all the time from the last the last album. So to me, it's kind of strange because we we started off with the bigger presentations, and then they steadily kind of got less and less. Um, of course, the raw experience was was amazing, and that was. That was the time when um, we, it was kind of the formative, you know, young era of Utopia. And we'd all come together and we were all getting really excited that we're going to have this musical career. And, um, and I think one of the records that we had put out had a, you know, we got a big uh, billboard on Sunset Boulevard and we just thought, well, we've hit the big time now. So, so it was a really exciting period of time. That was the t period of time when we got enough money from the advance to do to build the raw set. Well, it took us a couple of iterations before we got to the raw concept and what we were going to do with the pyramid and the sphinx head and all of that stuff. It actually, we we knew that we needed to bring in somebody who could, um, you know, who dealt with like productions and building stuff like that and. You know, knew how to spend one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars on something. It became sort of a, a, a bone of contention <laughs> a couple of years later that we had taken all of our. You know, everyone began to think, well, you know, if I had kept my part of that, I would have had thirty. You know, whatever. Uh, because it, it actually kind of started off as various ideas had gotten proposed, and I just remember one of them was like. Um, one of them, the stage looked like a big floating uh, uh, cough lozenge, and and but the, you know there's supposed to be something like very spectacular happening in it and something really cool, and so what they come up with was like they were going to put Todd up on a cherry picker and send him send him out and sending him out in the audience, and he was like no 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 that's what does that have has nothing to do with anything you know besides Mick Jagger has already done it. So it was like, no, we don't want the floating cough lozenge, and we don't want the cherry picker. We need something else. So we kept thinking about it, and I had actually, there was a lot of Egyptian mythology on my first record, Cosmic Furnace. And it's actually Le Forno Cosmique, the alchemical furnace of Cleopatra. So I was like reading all this stuff and, you know, kind of into it. And Todd was into the whole, you know, the eye of Horus and all this, and so I think somehow at well, some point it just popped into popped into our heads that um, you know that this is what we should do. So then we just went wild with it. It was like, well, you know, what could we do? How can we how can we play inside of a pyramid? You know, it's like, well, if it's only the the spine of it, maybe we could do it. But then we came up with this whole thing of singering in the glass guitar, um, which you know the whole second side is this like bizarre little, you know, surreal trip into some kind of strange mythology. Um, so the whole thing just kind of started coming together and, and the idea of the glass guitar, which, which I take credit for because I realized that we could do it out of ice and it would look like glass. The roadies then hated that. They had to figure out how to make a, an ice guitar that wouldn't break before Todd had to throw it off the top of the pyramid. Um, so it, it, it was just one laugh riot after another. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm glad that we did it. We had all sorts of, I mean, I, the stories that I have about that set and carrying it around. And we were driving around in like three tractor trailer trucks at the time. And we were basically like a, uh, a bar band. You know, we, we were trying to be like, the size of like KISS, but on like a bar band budget. Um, and we'd blown the whole advance building this monstrosity. Um, various things would work, various things wouldn't work. Everyone had a, um, an obstacle that they needed to overcome in the show to, you know, the four, you know, the four obstacles of life, you know, and, and mine was fire and they had flame jets out on the front of the stage and those things would go haywire and my eyebrows got singed once and um, Todd had to scramble up to the top and he had to beat earth so he had to go up and do a somersault and come down on a winch. Um, yeah. 
And um, let's see, chasm, poor chasm. Well, w Willie had, Willie's was water, and so we built this, these um, uh, water jets, like you'd see in a Las Vegas show or something. They would shoot water up with colored lights like seven feet in the air. And of course, the stage after that was totally wet, and Todd would usually fall into the, the water troughs. And chasm had uh, wind. And so they, had to ha they always had to have this huge, like, wind machine. And he had to pretend he was, like, fighting against the wind. And the funny thing I remember is, like, one time we played Texas. We were playing somewhere in Texas. And Rhodey got really cute. And Chasm's fighting the wind. And all of a sudden, like a tumbleweed goes <laughs> across the stage. And of course, this wind machine is just blowing this thing. And there comes another one. It's <laughs> so uh, the roadies had their, they had their fun with it as well. The ability to tour with a, with a, you know, with a big set and a bunch of special effects just became prohibitively expensive. Um, and the, actually, from what I understand, the, the Pyramid and the, the Sphinx, who we called Maurice, it's an 18-foot-tall Sphinx head, actually ended up in a Unitarian church in upstate New York. So um, religion. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we realized we couldn't, you know, support that type of thing anymore. Um, the other problem with the set was that you had to play a place big enough to accommodate that thing. And a lot of times, I mean, several times we played, there wasn't enough height. And Todd, you know, the whole culmination of the show was Todd going up to the top of the pyramid. Well, he'd go up and all you could see was his feet, you know. So that sort of took a little bit away from it as well. Um, so yeah, we scaled, we scaled back. And I think we, you know, we still tried to do interesting things during the show that would, um, you know, give people a little more than than just a, a band coming out in, you know, right. jeans and t-shirts. Um, so I, I believe we probably spent a little bit more time on costumes at that point. Um, we always had fun with that. MTV, when they, when they were forming, um, there, were, there were bids going out on the satellite to for a music service. I don't remember all the details of this, but I remember that like Todd had actually bid on doing essentially what MTV was going to do, but it was going to be like more live concerts. That was another part of the concept that he had was this video studio not only being a production facility for people to come up and, you know, produce things offline, but they would be able to actually have live broadcasts as well of, of concerts. And so people would, you know, he, he could produce these concerts and have them, you know, broadcast all over the world. And I think um, there was like a drawing or something for the bid, and the people who were starting MTV got it, and Todd didn't get it. So Todd's never been very fond of, of, of MTV, um, I, and I think part of it may have come from, <laughs> from this initial disappointment that, you know, that he was in competition with them, and they sort of, you know, they got there before he did. Um, but he's, used, he's been fairly averse to having any of his stuff show up there or even produce something that would be, you know, within their guidelines. I'm very happy and glad to have, to have been a part of it. I mean, I feel like what I've done and, you know, what the band did and what we did collectively, individually, um, does represent, you know, if you look back at the, quote, history of rock and roll for that period of time, um, I think we were probably one of the more interesting and um, creative bands. Um, there, there was a lot of stuff going on musically which was very mind-numbing, I think, during that period of time for the uh, 70s and early 80s. And I think that we represented an alternative to that. And I think because of the philosophical theme of the band and because of its kind of intellectual approach to things as well as, a, as its ability to play visceral music, you know, as well, I think just it represents um, a band which had a lot of facets to it. 
And I'm, I'm very proud to have been part of that. The spiritual thing comes out when you can essentially just sort of close your eyes and let your spirit talk through the music. A lot of that comes with having played for 40 years where the technique is kind of there and it's like learning a language where you can speak fluently in a language you don't need to be thinking about it and therefore it becomes a very natural kind of a process. And so the thing that I really enjoy the most still with music is that freedom of just being able to close my eyes and express something and you know listen to it later and say oh that, I kinda like that, that really expressed a mood or that really expressed a feeling. Music's a very abstract art, um, instrumental music very abstract art. People can interpret it in various ways. Um, someone might listen to a piece of music and say, oh, it's a very sad piece of music. Someone else goes, oh, what are you talking about? It's like it made me feel really warm and happy inside. So I love that because you might even think this, the, the different aspect about it the next time you listen to it. So I like the idea that it's a very abstract kind of a spiritual feeling that's coming out that you can then kind of describe later after it's done, but it's kind of like this, this uh, you know, real-time sculpture that's happening. Um, and that's what's exciting about you know, being a musician. At the time that I had met Todd, the first meeting would have been at the uh, Daryl Hall and John Oates recording for the War Babies album. Uh, Todd was the producer for that record, and at the time I was in uh, Hall and Oates, and um, Todd was the producer, so that was our actually our first meeting was in the studio. Well, I was always a Todd fan prior to the meeting. Um, I guess I had the only record I had by Todd at that point was Something Anything, and I had seen him perform once at Radio City, um, which was a crazy show, I remember the show, and um, so I had a, a musical expectation of uh, the person, not a, not a personal expectation, but one that I had gained through, you know, my enjoyment of his music. So I was excited to, to work with him, you know, on the project, not knowing, that, knowing his music and, and liking what he had done as a, a solo artist and as a producer there, so it was that was my first record that I had ever made as well, so the, the whole process was pretty memorable. The very first thing I did, Todd was in the studio doing initiation. So um, I came in and he had asked me to, he said, would you come in and play on Death of Rock and Roll? And I think, I think it was Kevin on drums and myself on drums and Rick Derringer played bass and I can't remember exactly who was on that track. But Todd had asked me to come in and play on that track, so that was the, the first Todd Willie recording that existed. Then after that, uh, we did um, Another Live was the name of the album, and that's the record that featured Todd, Roger, Moogie, Ralph, John Siegler, and Willie. Okay. And I called myself John Wilcox at that time just so that I, I could you know, represent my parents' name for an album or so, and then I dropped the John. When I joined Utopia and we did the Another Live project, it's, well, since I just went to Disneyland, I can, I'll use that analogy, it was like going to Disneyland. I mean, there were so many people in the band and, and um, I was excited to play the music. It was pretty challenging music and for a drummer it was a nice vehicle. Um, but it wasn't really like a band. It was like a free-for-all because there were so many people and everything, it was such an extravaganza, you know, it wasn't very intimate, it wasn't a very intimate experience, it was more this, you know, big process. In my musical background, I had gone to, you know, Manhattan School of Music and Berkeley School of Music. I studied a lot, you know, and I, I got to school on a scholarship. I had done a, a concerto, uh, the, uh, uh, Darius Mio had a concerto for percussion and small orchestra and I and that's what they used to graduate from Juilliard and I had done that performance in high school and I was very kind of very studied 
I loved jazz. I had all the old Blue Note records. But at the same time, I loved Hendrix, and I loved rock, and I loved heavy music. And I really loved R&B and, and uh, soul music, which I ended up in later years, you know, writing with a lot of artists, uh, pursuing that music. And the thing that I always wanted to bring to the band was feel, uh, like some heart and soul, because uh, also, as we talked about before, uh, the music at times could be very disjointed. And, and, and my constant um, job, I think my silent job, was to try to bring some kind of denominator to the music and make it feel good and make it feel like, I mean, if, if I had a choice at that time, I guess I did have the choice, but, but I didn't pursue it, I would have rather been playing with a, an R&B band or playing with a band that had a lot more feeling. Um, and, some, and that was the hardest thing, I think, for me being in Utopia, was to try to generate a good feel throughout that music and make that music feel good. When Cast joined the band, that, that was really the beginning of what I consider to be Utopia. And, and Utopia I consider to be, you know, Kasim, uh, Todd, Roger, and myself. Uh, it's the, the longest standing band, and I think the band that ended up, you know, being remembered as Utopia. Um, when Cass came into the band, uh, I remember he was very young, and uh, so from from a marketing standpoint, he you know he was cute and the girls liked him and it and it brought in an element that everybody every band needs you know uh, uh, someone that the girls are going to like, and uh, so that that was one thing that he brought into the band. He was also musically talented. He was a good singer. Uh, we needed um, good vocals in the band, so so Cass was a really good singer and he played bass well. Um, so you know, he was a, a, a good new member contribution. Well, I had known Roger from the prior incarnation of, of, of Utopia with the Another Live record, and we had been on tour together. So um, I had known Roger longer. And um, Roger and I had a camaraderie based on jazz music because we both loved you know, jazz. And, and whenever we had free time bef in sound checks, we would always noodle like, I would play drums and he'd play keys and, and we'd just do some, McCoy Tyner was a favorite of ours and, uh, and Herbie Hancock, so we'd play just by ourselves um, because we were really the only guys in the band that had the skill to, to play that kind of music, you know, for real. And so we'd do that and also I played some bass, so I would either play bass with him and we'd do Horace Silver kind of things, Bossa Nova-ish things. And so we had that camaraderie and that general interest together and I remember him being very, um, uh, technical. Um, he seemed to be studied, you know, he had, he had a good music background and had good facility playing, so, um, you know, I, I, that, that's, that was my experience. The one thing, all of us, all of us really like were big Beatle fans. There was a lot of, there was a lot of denominators uh, stylistically that we had. I, um, and the, the differences were, you know, really, you know, Roger, like you said, was into jazz and kind of and Cass came from a pop world. Todd was Todd, and had you know his influences, The Who and those old bands. And um, so I think we had. I, although people may say that it, that we had you know vast differences, I, I I think that there was a lot of similarities. If you're the keyboard player, you have the ability to, you know, to when when you're the drummer, you're not in a harmonic instrument, and and you don't have the ability when you're sitting in on a band session to say, uh, oh, let's do this, let's do that, because you're sitting behind a set of drums. So, so when you have a harmonic instrument in your hands, it lends itself to being able to contribute in that way. Um, also, Roger had done, I believe he had done a solo record before Utopia. And so he kind of brought what he was doing as a solo artist into the band. And the band kind of became a vehicle for some of his pieces, which were really Roger pieces, with Utopia playing them. We'd have times where we were really all close and we'd hang out and we'd have times where, you know, we'd pair off. I, just the natural things, you know. We'd have times where we'd at each other's throats um, and it was just a struggle to, to be in the same place at the same time. Not necessarily because we didn't like each other, but as you mentioned, being concentrated in, in a situation like this and being under the daily pressures, whether you're doing press, show up, you know, to play the concerts, be on the plane, travel in the bus, and. Da, 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 da. It's, it's, um, it, it can take its toll, so we ran the, the emotional gamut.
geez, I wasn't personally conscious of it being intellectual, but but I know that that uh, in in terms of what the way that musicians write, um, there was a lot of care taken to not do it in the in the same old way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I think brought about you know what what you may call you know being intellectual. It's a, it it was just a lot of care of not just playing you know a standard song using the standard changes and the melody and and doing it the same old way. Well, the POV record was probably the the record that I had the most contribution on because I wrote half the record and and co-produced it with Todd. And of course, there was a lot of friction around that album, but it happens to be the record that I was the most involved in. I mean, I wrote a lot in, in a lot of the other records, but that would be the record that I contributed the most to. Well, I would either do the, the, the like hard rock songs um, or, uh, or the ballads. At a certain point, Todd really wasn't writing his Todd pop ballads. And um, I definitely was a big fan of the way that he wrote ballads, as a lot of people were. So I took it upon myself to, to write them myself so that, that then he wouldn't have to come up with doing them. So we had some good collaborations where Todd and I wrote those songs, like uh, Mated was one of those songs where I wrote all the music and Todd did the lyrics and melodies. I liked POV because it was a lot of me. Um, and I liked, uh, I think the, you know, the double Utopia record I liked a lot. I know our last show I think was at um, Universal Amphitheater in LA. I think that was the very last show. And I remember that being sad. Because you all knew, obviously. We knew that it was our last show. It's kind of one of those things where um, you knew it was time to break up. You knew you should break up. But breaking up was so hard to do. Finally, we just made the decision. We had worked so hard. Um, and I think, I think we should have been more commercially successful than we were. And there was a, there was a, a number of things that contributed to that. But just the, the accumulation of punches at that point really rendered us, you know, th to make the decision that, you know, we just need to stop. And so we did. But it wasn't really like, stop, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, see you later. It wasn't really, you know, we weren't upset. It just, we were exhausted, I think, you know, mm -hmm. collectively exhausted. We tried for a long, long time to, to make that band be able to take care of itself financially and be successful. Um, in the process, we made a lot of great music, uh, but it was, time to stop. I mean, it just, that was the end. So, and, the, and that was, I think, the Universal Amphitheater. Then from that point, um, I went on to pursue uh, um, songwriting, writing for different publishing companies. I went right after that to Screen Gems Music. I was there for a year. Then I went to Columbia Pictures um, in L.A. and I had had a number one dance record with this artist named Stacy Q and um, a song in a movie called Soul Man. And I was just doing write, you know, writing projects. Um, and I continued to do that and, and wrote with a number of, then, then I got to kind of start to fulfill my R&B um, fantasies and I wrote with Luther Vandross and the Pointer Sisters, Natalie Cole, and had a lot of those records recorded. And things just kind of continued on and I can just speed it up to, currently I'm the staff senior composer and sound designer for Sci-Fi Channel and USA Networks in New York and, uh, and I'm still composing. When you're in a studio by yourself, you, I'm the engineer, I'm the producer and, and, and the, the, the shows in, with sci-fi are, are varied. The, the music is very varied. So we'll have, um, uh, I may be doing techno music, I may be doing rap stuff, I may be doing drum and bass, I may be doing like a classical score for a movie. Um, uh, it could be heavy stuff, you know, Linkin Park style, alternative rock. The, the requirements are, are, are pretty varied depending on what kind of shows that we're doing. I think I, I really learned a lot about making music and, and um, writing music. Uh, you know, I, I, I still consider Todd a very great songwriter. And uh, so it was, that was a great experience to, to be around someone who had that kind of experience and, and that depth of, uh, you know, being able to write. Um, the other 
portion of that experience that was really helpful is that when I'm working like with the artists that I'm working with now, I learned how to be a band member, like it or not. And when you're a band member, you, you, there's certain concessions that you have to make. But then the other beautiful thing about it is that you're learning from the other people that you're working with, which is really what collaboration is about. So whenever I work on another project with another artist, I can put on the hat of a band member. And when I'm working with them and producing, I'm really joining, I'm, I'm a band with this person. And I know what that is. I know where it comes from. And uh, so that, I always bring that experience with me in the projects. you know, the, the, the quality of the music and, and the general musicianship because to this day I still get people coming up and saying, you know, and, and not really people who are, are fans like saying, you've changed, you know, our, our life with your music, which I still do here, which is really nice. Um, but I think the thing that, that as a musician that, that I appreciate is that I still bump into musicians and many of them famous musicians come up and say, uh, you know, we, I love Utopia. You guys are such a great band. And that, so there was a lot of respect uh, amongst other musicians for this band. And I think being a musician and taking, you know, my music so seriously, that is probably the thing that I'm most proud of. The, the, the official name that, that, that I deemed for the machine was called the Trapparatus, drums being called traps in the old days, and it was, a tra it was an apparatus, so it became the Trapparatus. Um, we were, I think it came about for the Raw Tour. I think it was some time around that time period, and I know for a fact that, that we were all doing solos. And I know that I, the last thing that I wanted to do was go out and do another 30-minute drum solo. Everybody had done drum solos. It was so boring. And, you know, it's like, God, I don't want to hear an yet another drum solo in a concert. So I said, well, if I'm going to go out and play a drum solo, it be something unique about the experience to begin with before we even hear a note. Um, and so then we, amongst the band, started talking about um, what could we do? What kind of thing could we put it on? What could we make, you know? And, uh, and <clears throat> the idea of a motorcycle came up like a motorcycle frame. So we ended up going and getting, I think, I don't know if it was a Harley frame or what, but we got a motorcycle frame and we mocked it up. I remember uh, Rick Downey, who was one of our, um, who did lights for us and, and also tour managed and things, was very kind of good at, you know, making things and creating things. So he and, and the rest of the crew started gathering parts for this machine. And we had a, a motorcycle frame and then they just took some flat panel metal and welded together to make the hi-hat pedal. The bass drum pedal was very unique because we took, when you play a bass drum, step on the pedal, there's a chain. You have a chain drive pedal. So when you press on that, it turns the rod that turns the chain that makes the beater hit. But we had a problem is that we thought, well, it'd be really cool if the beater was four feet away. How do we get it up there? So what we ended up doing is making a dual tower and then taking another you played here, made the chain go, but then the other chain ran to the front of this trapparatus, which was four feet away. So every time you hit the pedal back here, the beater up in the front hit, hit the pad. So then we also got in, into using um, sampled sounds because we could come up, we went in the studio, I, I went in and sampled my own drums and had these really great big drum sounds. So we utilized a company, uh, it was Clavi was the company, and they made these D-drums. So we had all the D-drums on these things. So you'd hit this bass drum, but you'd hear the sound of this big acoustic, you know, drum going. And uh, we used um, exhaust pipes that came out that held the cymbals. But we used real cymbals because it was just too hard to duplicate the sound of a cymbal uh, with a sample. So we had exhaust pipes coming up. And then they started building on um, things that were just for show, you know, pipes coming out the back. and. Then um, we built it on top of a motor-driven um, motor with, that would spin this thing on, a, on an actual shaft. And then we put a, a black um, uh, wood around it so that it looked like that the, that the motorcycle was balanced on the tip of a pyramid. And we had aircraft lights on it. And when, then when I did my drum solo, the, the, the roadies would, my, my drum roadie would operate the, uh, uh, the speed. 
And so as we got further into the tour, the, the, the fun for everybody was to have the roadies run the machine as fast as possible while I was playing my solos, you know, and the centrifugal force was, you know, would just get to the point where I would actually have to hold on and then I'm not going like this and people are probably going, oh, look, he's doing something with one hand. It's like, well, that was just for survival. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't an artistic decision. It was, you know, a life or death situation. I'm, I, I can tell you that I remember distinctly the first day that I showed up on stage with that and, and going up there and it just felt like I was butt ass naked, you know. I, I was sitting on this machine and people were just kind of, wasn't a happy face, wasn't a, uh, you know, like this kind of face. It just was nothing, no expressions. And I was like, Fuck, what is this? What, what, what are these people thinking? What am I doing? It's pretty funny. It was 1976, I think, like in the early part of 1976, March, April, and I was um, involved with a, a number of people in a small group, a small circle of of uh, musicians: uh, Cherry Vanilla, uh, Earl Slick, uh, Michael Kamen, Mick Ronson. Um, and I was kind of just like hanging around, trying to like weasel my way into whatever uh, gigs I could possibly find. I was at, actually playing piano at the time with um, with Cherry Vanilla, and uh, Michael came and uh, kind of took me under his wing and and uh, uh, took a l little bit of an interest in what I was doing and stuff. And uh, Roger gave Michael a call and told Michael that Utopia was looking for a bass player. Um, and I, I, I believe what happened was I, I went to uh, Earl Slick's house, who lives on Staten Island. Earl's a, a guitar player, who actually plays with David Bowie right now. And um, we had to drive him to the airport. Me and a friend of mine had to drive him to the airport. And Michael had just called uh, Slick up uh, to say, do you know any bass players? Uh, Todd Rundgren's looking for one. Um, and Slick mentioned it to me, uh, and he said, if, you, if you're interested, call Michael up and tell him that you'd like to do the, the gig. I called Michael as soon as I got to the airport, and uh, as soon as I got to JFK, and uh, he said, I, I thought you played piano. I didn't even know you played bass. He said, but I'll recommend you anyway. He called Roger up, uh, and the next day Roger called me. I uh, borrowed 20 bucks from my uncle, um, went to the Port Authority in New York City, took a bus up to Woodstock, met Roger and Willie. Todd at the time was vacationing in uh, India. Uh, I think he was like mopedding across uh, a part of India or something and, and um, uh, did a little rehearsing with the guys before Todd came. Todd came the next day, uh, met me and we played together and um, I joined the band right after that. I, you know, I, I went up there with the, uh, with the thought that I was probably not going to get the gig. Um, I went up there more as the experience to play with some people who were, you know, professional musicians and really accomplished and had been, you know, doing this for a long time, uh, just to kind of broaden my, my horizons. I, I, I really didn't expect that I would, that I would be joining the band. I thought that, uh, Better I do it and not get it than not do it and definitely not get it, you know. Um, so when I went up and, and met Roger and Willie and they played me some of the stuff that, uh, that they were doing, actually they had just finished recording the Faithful record, which um, had more of a pop feel to it than most Todd records uh, that I had heard, um, uh, or Todd Utopia records. Even though Faithful wasn't really a Utopia record, um, it was a Todd solo record. There was still the band still played on it, uh, as opposed to when he did his solo records. It was just Todd. So I was kind of like, well, this isn't bad, you know. This is pretty cool stuff, and um, and so I was. I looked at it more as a challenge than anything else. And then uh, I really liked Willie and Roger, and Roger was really really nice to me. Willie was was really nice to me. We got along well. Then the next day, Todd came back from India, and um, 
he was a little weird. He was a little standoffish, you know. He really didn't say much to me. Just was like, oh, this is the new bass player. You know, we have to try out today. You know, and so, okay, great. Well, you know, all right, let's play a little bit. And then I had to perform a little bit for them to show them I could sing. And I played a couple of songs on piano or something. And uh, I was a little intimidated. I was I was a little intimidated with uh, with Todd because um, that's just the type of person he was. He wasn't very uh, warm. He's not a very, he, he's not a very warm and fuzzy guy. Um, but uh, I figured, you know, hey, what the hell? I, I have nothing to lose. So I did the, those two days up there, and I went home. I took a bus home. Then the next, I think I was, I was up there for like two days. I took a bus home, and um, then the next day I got a call from Roger that uh, I had that they had decided that I I would be in the band, um, and then the following couple I think a couple of days after that I had to go back up to Woodstock to uh, rehearse for the tour and or for whatever we were doing, um, whether it was a tour or a record I forget, uh, and I had to drive up with Todd. Todd has had an apartment at the time on Jane Street in Manhattan. And um, so I, I went into the city. I packed a bag. I went into the city. I took my guitar, took the train to the ferry and the ferry over and the subway up to Jane Street. And um, Todd had this um, like Bronco or something like that, uh, like a kind of a truck type four wheel drive thing. And um, and we drove up to Woodstock. It's a three hour drive from or well, two and a half hour drive from Manhattan to up to. Um, Mincala, where he lived, and he didn't say one word to me the whole time in that car. He did, I mean, like maybe he maybe said hello when I got to his apartment, and then that was it. And then for the whole ride, I uh, I didn't say. You know, I was like, I, well, should I say something? Should I? T you know, should I start a conversation? Uh, I was just. I was kind of you know. Intimidated, I guess, is the is the best word to to use, you know. I had come into the band as um, a replacement bass player. Uh, John Siegler had left, and um, I'm pretty sure, although I'm not 100 percent sure, that there was gigs to be done right away. So I had to learn um, a set's worth of Utopia material before anything else, you know, before we started doing any kind of writing or recording. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure that that's, that took up most of my time, was learning, you know, just a, a, an amazing amount of material um, with, you know, it wasn't very conventional. It wasn't like a, a conventional pop tune where it's like, you know, verse, chorus, uh, uh, solo verse chorus out you know there was like all kinds of twists and turns and stops and you know um, odd time signatures and and uh, so it it kind of like it kind of took me a little while to to get that under my belt and uh, get comfortable with playing those songs and then plus two there was a lot of singing involved because everybody in the band sang so um, it was you know it was hard work uh, we did those first few shows and then I remember we signed um, to Bearsville Records. We uh, we did a, uh, I don't know whether the band was on Bearsville before that or not, but um, we signed to Bearsville and then uh, we started to record uh, the first record that I was on, which was Ra. Um, and that was the whole conceptual, you know, the pyramid and the they made me wear a dress, and you know, so I remember calling my mother up and saying, "They're making me wear a dress, ma, on my first album cover," because I had a toga on on the first cover. And um, so uh, Todd had this whole big idea, this whole big plan involved about you know how it was going to be, and the set was going, the tour was going to coincide with the record, and it was going to be this whole big thing, and. Um, it was, you know, it was, it was pretty cool. Uh, I really, I was still getting my feet wet at that time, you know. I was still um, sort of feeling my way around, finding out what I could do, what I shouldn't do, what I could say, what I shouldn't say. Um, For instance? Uh, well, 
Um, I think just the simple fact that I was the newest member in the band uh, and, and trying to be as polite and as gentlemanly as possible, um, I just didn't make a lot of suggestions, you know. I just kept my mouth shut and, and pretty much um, did what I was told to do. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, that lasted for probably six months to a year until I felt comfortable enough to make some kind of, uh, you know, suggestions as to what we, we should or shouldn't do. If you were in the band, then that means that you were thought enough of that you, your, um, your ideas were at least, you know, worthy of a listen. So, uh, and I also think that it's like anything else, you know, it's like, well, you're the bass player, you play the bass, you know, play the bass. Don't ask me to tell you exactly what notes to play. You play what you think is right, and if, if it's not right or if, it, or if there's something better, then we'll tell you. Um, so I had a, a lot of freedom in that sense that I was able to do what uh, what I kind of felt was necessary for any given song or part. Or... Well, Roger really was, um, and I'm sure still is, is a, a real, I don't know, if I want to say musician or uh, very um, exact, you know, like uh, Roger, first of all, he reads music. Uh, I don't know, Willie might, but uh, I know I don't, and, I, and I'm pretty sure Todd doesn't, um, or the little bit that we do read would be just enough to get by. Um, but Roger writes and reads music, and he knew, you know, every single chord that you could possibly know. Uh, he had a really good harmonic sense, and he he brought to the band um, this kind of uncanny ability to, to to do all these really, really beautiful and weird chord changes and uh, and keyboard changes, and he seemed to know. Um, how to fit a keyboard part um, around a chord change, you know, or like write a, 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 a melody into a keyboard part that wasn't necessarily the melody of the song, but became an important part of the song unto itself. <laughs> Roger was, was brilliant in his ability to, you know, to turn a solo um, in a song that you would say to yourself, is that a guitar or is that a keyboard? Is that a synth part or is that a guitar part? You know, and, um, really was able to play the synthesizer and solo sections like a guitar. And, and I thought that, that was really, really cool. And his, his chordal sense was, um, it was just great. You know, it was really, really cool. Willie and I, I think, were the closest in, in terms of the kind of music that we listened to, although ro both Roger and Willie were real jazz heads at that time. They were really, uh, I remember once taking a plane uh, and sit, I was either sitting next to Willie or Roger, I'm not sure, but um, there was, uh, I, I was listening to something on, on headphones in, in my seat and um, this guy in front of me had asked to turn, he said, I can hear your headphones, would you please turn it down? Um, and I remembered, like, you know, kind of giving him a dirty look and just, you know, tisking him and, um, and saying, you know, probably old fart, you know, what do you know? Um, it turned out to be McCoy Tyner. And, uh, and I told, uh, I think when we got off the plane, Roger said, to, either Roger or Willie said, to him, you know who that was? That was McCoy Tyner. And you, t you know, and you made a face at him. Um, so they were real big jazz heads, and uh, and I really wasn't so much into into jazz. Um, but Willie also, as much as he liked that particular genre of music, also enjoyed you know the heavy stuff too. Um, I, I mean, you'd have to ask him what bands he was listening to at the time. I'm I'm not sure, but I think we shared a similar taste in uh, in the stuff that we listened to outside of the band. You know, it's like, oh, did you hear that one? Yeah, that's really cool. You know, we should do a song like that or um, uh, whatever band was popular at the time. 
my background and, and what I think that I contributed to the band was um, more along the lines of, uh, of the pop side, I guess. You know, the three and a half minute song. Um, the, you know, let's get everybody to sing along. Um, because I was, uh, you know, I came from the Beatles era, and that was really what drove me to become a musician was watching the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. And uh, once, once I saw that, it, my feeling was that's it. I don't have to find a job. I know exactly what it is I want to do with the rest of my life. Um, so I, you know, and that's kind of the stuff that I write, and uh, and and my sensibility falls into that, you know, specific area. Uh, and then once I got into Utopia, I was kind of like, I was a little, my, my musical horizons broadened a little bit. And, uh, and I was listening to a lot, a, a lot different stuff at that time. Um, so, I, I mean, it just, you know, it just, it's like a natural thing, you know, you grow up you, and you, you just, you want to learn as much as you can about as many different things. I mean, it wasn't until I started working with with the band and and Todd specifically that uh, I I appreciated him as much as I do today as a songwriter, um, and I just think that he's like one of the one of the best songwriters that's around. You know, uh, his um, he's very intuitive. He's very uh, you know he just knows how to write a melody and a lyric and a chord change that makes you, you know, just gives you some, you know, kind of tingles, you know. Um, and he still does, you know. Uh, but I've always uh, admired him as, uh, as a songwriter and uh, always will. It's a very difficult thing being on the road, especially with a small band like that, uh, because you're with each other 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and um, you know, as much as you like to think, yeah, it's great and it's wonderful and it's glamorous, and you know, we're taking limos and we're having parties, and all these fans are sleeping outside my hotel room door. Um, you know, that's all well and good, and but that really wears thin after a while, and and there comes a point where you just, you know what, just leave me alone. I just want to be by myself, you know. It's like I see you on stage, I see you backstage, I see you before the show, I see you after the show, I see you on the bus, I see you at dinner. I see you, you know, in the morning when I wake up and just before I go to bed at night. I don't want to see you when I don't have to. Um, so as much as we liked each other and, and we certainly got along, um, and we did have, we had a great time. We had really, really fun times. We would laugh and, um, and we did a lot of stupid things together. But, uh, you know, they're just, they're, there comes a time when you just say, you know what, I, I have, I've had enough. I've got to go home right now. i, I got to go home. I'll give you a call when I'm supposed to see you again in a month. You start with a record you know, um, or you start with an idea for a record or a couple of songs for a record. And that determines what the kind of direction everything else goes in after that. So, it, you know, the rest of the record after those first couple of songs, um, the tour, the merchandise, the, you know, everything that comes after, uh, you know, after that initial idea. Um, more often than not, the initial idea came from Todd, and Todd would write a couple of three songs or four songs and say, this is what the new record's going to be. Um, and then it was up to us to kind of fill in the gaps. And um, there were a couple of times where we, we came in with, um, we all came in with different material and, and would say, okay, well, you know, I have this piece of a song, let's put it together with that piece of a song, or we used to call them musical modules, and uh, we would, uh, you know, say, well, I have a verse, or okay, okay, I have this chorus, let's see if we can work this verse and this chorus together. Um, 
but I think that the majority of the record started with an idea that Todd had. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how the tour would, would go after that. Okay, well now we have this record called Oops Wrong Planet and we're taking a picture with everybody in t-shirts and, and black jeans and sneakers. All right, well that's what we're going to wear on the road. We're going to wear t-shirts, black jeans and sneakers. And we're going to play these songs that we did on this record and a few other songs. And I mean, that's just how, how it goes. Todd and, and Willie always butted heads, you know, um, and they always were at odds about what direction the band should go in or what we should be doing, or what we shouldn't be doing. Um, and uh, Roger was kind of leaned a little bit more towards Todd's side. And myself, um, well, I had a solo career that I was working on at that time and uh, so I was like you know you guys battle it out I'm, I'm easy I'll just go whatever way you want um, yeah maybe I, I should have opened my mouth a little bit more but uh, I just you know at that at that time I just thought you know what I'll let the big guys battle it out and I'll just take a back seat and wherever the chips fall I'll go with that At that point, I had left the band just before that record. I, I, had, uh, I had decided that I really wanted to concentrate on my solo career and, and put as much time and effort uh, into that as I did into, into Utopia. Um, so I made the decision that you know it was time for me to leave. And I, I left. And uh, six months later, I came crawling back to the band. I, I, I asked to, to, if I could come back. I was extremely unhappy not being in the band. Um, I was uh, I was really disillusioned at, at what at, as, at how much work it took to do it by yourself at that point. And I was really by myself. I, uh, I had a manager, and it was me, and that's it. Um, yeah, I had some people that I played with, but uh, it just. You know, it's funny because um, when, uh, way back in 76 when we signed with Bearsville Records, we signed not only as a band collectively, but we signed individually as well. And, um, and uh, Albert uh, Grossman, I, I remember going to him and saying, look, I want to record my solo record. I want to record my solo record. And, and I had like this kind of publishing deal that en enabled me to record at Bearsville Studios 100 hours a year. Um, every year. So I would do my demos up uh, in Bearsville Studios and um, he would always say, no, you're not ready. You're not ready. Your songs aren't good enough yet. They're not, they're not great. They need to be better. You need to just keep doing it. Just keep doing it. And I got fed up. I, I got fed up with waiting and um, decided that, look, you know what? EMI wants to sign me to a record label, uh, to, to a record deal. I'm going to go with EMI. I said, all right, fine. No problem. Goodbye. And, uh, and so I went and made my record with EMI, and it turns out that I wasn't ready, you know. Uh, that as much as it, it irks me to say he was right, he was right. Um, so coming back to the band was, it was a big relief for me that they wanted me, you know, that, that they allowed me to come back. I really... Um, they missed you. Though. I don't know. I don't know that they missed me. I, I don't know. I, I don't know that they missed me, but uh, they somehow, for whatever reasons, let me let me come back. And um, but I just wanted known that I I wasn't asked to come back. I asked, and um, I'm glad because they were, they had already recorded a bunch of songs. I think maybe half a dozen songs. And uh, so I, at that point, it was like, oh, okay. Um, I had a much better idea of what direction we were going in and where that record was going musically. Um, and then I kind of, you know, con made my contributions. Uh, and at the end of the day, we, would, we, were in, we had like 15 or 16 songs that we all thought were album worthy. And, uh, and that's why that record wound up being an album and a half.